Hebrews is addressed to the Hebrew believers who were thinking of going back to the old sacrificial system. And the author has expounded 12 chapters, many, many pages, extolling the virtues of Jesus Christ as our final great sacrifice. And in light of the great sacrifice that Jesus made on our behalf, the appropriate response is one of worship, one of praise, one of exaltation, that we exalt the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ because of what he has done. So as we glorify God, we are strengthened and we testify to the reality that one day all of creation will worship him. As you go about each day, take time to offer up these sacrifices of praise to the Lord. So our format is worship, prayer, study, and comments and questions. And since it's the sacrifice of praise, I was going to pull up that old song. Some of you remember that we bring the sacrifice of praise. You remember that old one? Uh, that's an old, old 1970s song. <laughs> but I chose not to. So I hope you enjoy the one that I did choose. Uh, yes, that's a disco song. So let's listen to the song. You can click the link in the room. And when you're done, please click done. Then we will continue.
Yes, we do offer the sacrifice of praise, as the song says, because he is the God beyond all praising. So let us look at our scripture. We're almost done. Is everybody almost done with the song? Give one more half a minute. Okay. We'll look at our scripture and then I'll pray. It's Hebrews 13, 15 through 16, through him, that is through Christ Jesus. Then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Do not neglect to do good and to share what you have, for such sacrifices are pleasing to God. So gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that you have given the most ultimate and final sacrifice that allows us to give you back what we can, and that is a sacrifice from our lips, giving you praise. Help us, learn, help us to learn to be thankful in all things, Father, to be grateful, to be contented, to offer you sacrifices of praise, even during the hard times, that you will be glorified, you will be magnified. Father, we ask you to teach us and speak to us through your word, that we might glorify you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you've ever read through the Psalms, actually, Thomas and I were talking about this yesterday. I have a pattern whereby when I'm reading through scriptures, I read three Psalms every day. And I just go through the book of Psalms. When I get to 150, I go back to Psalm 1 and begin again. And that way you read through, if you followed that pattern, you read through the book of Psalms seven times in a year. And it's, it's very refreshing to your heart, to your soul. As a matter of fact, the heading of Psalm 100 calls it a psalm for giving thanks. When you read through Psalm 100, you notice that every verb is a command. It commands us to shout, to worship, to come, to know, to enter, to give thanks, to give praise, and a look at if you look at Psalm 105, uh, the, just the first few verses, and you notice the exact same things. There's lots of commands, C commands like give thanks, call upon his name, make known his name, sing to him, praise his name, tell of his wonderful goodness, glory in him, seek his face, look, and even the word remember. I think that's a, a very important word is the word remember, that we need to remember the good things of the Lord, for he has declared them to us, and we can give him thanks in all things. And as we were speaking in the room earlier, thanks for, for all things. Let me give you that, that reference here, which is found in Ephesians Five. I'm going to give you actually two. Uh, it, Ephesians five. It's it, it's it's. I'm just amazed that Shalom and I are on the same page. <laughs> what she talked about last night, it always fits in with what what I'm doing. It, it's just amazing. The Holy Spirit is wonderful. Ephesians 5, Paul writes, do not get drunk with wine, for it is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God, the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul also writes in the book of Colossians, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell richly, teaching, admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything 
in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. You know, you think about it. Christianity is the only religion that sings, that abounds in songs to our creator. Atheism is songless. They have nothing to sing about and no one to sing it to. Agnosticism has nothing to sing about. The various forms of idolatry are not tuneful, but God's people say, oh, come, let us sing unto the Lord. And when Christ came, think about it, the angels greeted his birth with praise. And since then, Christian song has gained in fullness and strength of voice with each century. The people of God have always been a singing people. Jews have their song of faith and Christians have their psalms and hymns. Singing has always been a part of man's worship of God. And it was especially a part of the divine worship at the temple. The Westminster Shorter Catechism asked the question, what is the chief end of man? And the answer is, man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. The most important element in the purpose of human life is to glorify God. In our lives, in our Christian life, we should always place the chief emphasis on glorifying God. And the person who does this will truly enjoy God, both here and in the hereafter. But the person who thinks of enjoying God apart from glorifying God is in danger of supposing that God exists for us instead of man, we exist for the glory of God. To stress enjoying God more than glorifying God will result in a falsely mystical or emotional type of religion. I love that. Thank you, I. Rejoice always. Pray without seeking. In everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Um, well, <laughs> To answer your question, violinist, there are churches that don't teach truth. So I would venture to guess. I don't know. Anyway, so if we want to fulfill the chief purpose for which God created you and created me, we must live to glorify God by enjoying him forever so that our joy in God spills over into continual praise of God. But the Bible links the first great commandment, that is to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength, with the second great commandment, that is to love our neighbor as ourselves. Now, to move to a monastery where we cut ourselves off from others and live in perpetual praise to God falls short of what really pleases him. He wants us to offer our lives as continual sacrifices of praise to him, but also not, as the verse we read today, not to neglect to do good and to share what you have. For such sacrifices are pleasing to God. In other words, we glorify God both by a life that continually spills over to praise toward God and by practical good deed. Faith always expresses itself in obedience. That's something we really need to focus on. Faith always expresses itself in obedience. So the main point I want to bring out here is through Christ, we should offer to God sacrifices of praise and good deeds which please him. So the author is confirming that there is no longer any animal sacrifices to be offered. There's no need to go back to the temple worship because Jesus is the complete and final sacrifice for our sins. We need no other sacrifice for atonement, but we do offer sacrifices to God, not to gain forgiveness of sins, but because we possess forgiveness 
in Christ. We are offering him praise that rises from a heart of gratitude and thank for his atoning sacrifice for our sins. Our sacrifices are thank offerings, and they are not just occasional, but notice the word continual. We offer the sacrifices of praise and of good deeds, and these sacrifices please God. Now, our text is going to make four different points. First point we're going to look at is everything we do in the Christian life is through Christ. It is through Christ, through his righteousness, through his atoning sacrifice. Second point, through Christ, we should offer to God continual sacrifices of praise. Third point, through Christ, we should offer to God continual sacrifices of good deeds. And fourth point is God is pleased with our sacrifices of praise and good deeds. Pleased is the word I'm using. I'm not saying we have gained favor. We already have that. That's why we're offering the sacrifice of praise in the first place, because we've already gained favor and unmerited grace and mercy from a God who owes us nothing. Isn't that amazing? That is amazing. Everything we do in the Christian life is through Christ. Notice that the scripture says we are to offer sacrifices through him, that is through Christ. The, the only way that we can approach the holy God is through the shed blood of Jesus Christ. If we try to offer our good works to God apart from Christ, he would view them, according to Isaiah, as filthy rags. Our works don't cut it. Men have approached God through sacrifices since the beginning of human history. Cain brought a sacrifice from the, from the ground, and his brother Abel brought the firstlings of his flock. Surely God was not arbitrary in rejecting God, Cain's sacrifice and accepting Abel's, Abel's. God had made it clear when he clothed Adam and Eve with the skins of an animal that the only sacrifice acceptable to approach him was one that involved shedding the blood of an innocent substitute. As a matter of fact, the entire Old Testament sacrificial system that was later instituted under Moses pointed ahead to God's supreme and final sacrifice, the Lord Jesus Christ, who died as the substitute for all that believe in him. So the author of Hebrews has made it abundantly clear that Jesus fulfilled in his death what the Old Testament sacrificial system could only point to, could only foreshadow. We read about this in the Hebrews chapter 10 a few weeks ago, where it says, for since the law was but a shadow of the good things to come, instead of the true form of these realities, it can never, by the same sacrifices that are continually offered every year. Uh, uh, sorry, I lost my place. <laughs> Make perfect those who draw near. Otherwise, would they not have ceased to be offered since the worshipers, having been cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins? But in these sacrifices, there is a reminder of sins every year, for it is impossible for the blood of goats, bulls and goats to take away sin. So you see, the sacrifices were sufficient, but they were not perfect because they pointed ahead to the one that was perfect. He continues in, later in the chapter 10, and by that will we have sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God. Why did he sit down? Because his work was finished. It was done, waiting from that time until his enemies would be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single, one single offering, he has perfected for all times those who are being sanctified. You see, Christ 
completed the Father's will by offering himself as the sacrifice for our sins. And he continues in this same manner. Manner, The author confirms this once, once for all completed work of Jesus Christ. The topic is not the process of sanctification, but the once for all change in our status when we were united with Christ by faith. In this way, we are separated from sin's pollution and thus qualified for the worship of God in his temple. Why can we come into his presence on a Sunday morning? It is because God has invited us and God has cleansed us, and we are able through Christ to offer that sacrifice of praise. His one offering of himself completed, fulfilled, it ended the Jewish sacrificial system. To offer animal sacrifices to God now is to deny the once for all sacrifice of Christ for our sins. So if you've not if you've not come through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ as the substitute for your sins, you have nothing to offer. You are under his just condemnation for your sins. So you must discard all of your good deeds, all of your personal merit, and flee to the cross of Christ. It's the only way. And once you have come to faith in Christ Jesus, as the substitute for your sins, you must come to Christ for everything in the Christian life. Paul emphasizes this in Ephesians chapter 1. He says, Blessed be the Lord, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us. How? In Christ. How has he, what has he blessed us with? He goes on to say, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. You see what Christ earned by his very being is ours by faith, by grace. I love the comment that John Piper makes on this verse. He says this, every sinner who comes to God in Christ with all his needs finds God coming to him in Christ with all his promises. Now, I've said this for the past two weeks. I'll say it again. The promise, the fulfillment of the promise always far out exceeds the promise. Piper goes on to say, when a sinful person meets the holy God in Christ, what he hears is, yes, God, do you love me? Yes, will you forgive me? Yes, will you accept me? Yes, will you help me change? Yes, will you give me the power to serve you? Yes, will you keep me? Yes, will you show me your glory? Yes, all the promise of God, all the blessings of God in the heavenly places are yes in Christ Jesus. Jesus is God's decisive yes to all who believe. That's you and me. His yes is to you and his yes is to me. It is always, always yes in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we can offer a sacrifice of praise. The only way that we can come to God in the first place is through faith in Christ. The only way we can be sustained and held up in the Christian life is through faith in Jesus Christ. Everything in Christian life comes through Christ. Everything we do in this Christian life must be done through Christ for his glory. It's an affront to his sacrifice to think that we can come to God through any mediator, whether the Virgin Mary or the saints or some earthly priest or some pope. Christ alone is our high priest. Everything is through him and to him and for him. Amen. It's all for his glory. Yes. Thank you for posting that. All the promises of God find their yes in him in Christ. Second point, through Christ, we should offer to God continual sacrifices of praise. Praise to God is not just a nice thing to do once in a while when you feel like it. The Psalms are filled with the command, 
praise the Lord. It's not a suggestion for something you might try when you don't have anything better to do. It's a command to permeate everything you do. As the author here exhorts, let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. Praise to God should be the whole thrust of our lives. We are to be captivated. We are to be filled with the greatness, with the goodness, with the grace and the majesty of God that like a cup full to the brim, we're always spilling over in praises to him. True praise must come from the heart. And so the command implies and demands that our hearts are right before him. God sees our hearts. If in our hearts we constantly grumble and complain about the way that God is treating us, and then we come to church and put on our happy face and sing praises to God, that we're just putting on a mask. We're being hypocrites. We've got to deal with our hearts before we can bring a true sacrifice of praise to God. Confess your sinful grumbling to God. Seek the satisfaction and joy that comes through faith in Christ alone. Otherwise, your praises will be hollow and not heartfelt. Your good deeds will not be acceptable to God. True praise and genuine good deeds flow from a heart that is satisfied in God alone and in his abundant grace in Jesus Christ. Charles Spurgeon had this to say, This is from a sermon on uh, called a, a Lifelong Occupation. Dear brothers and sisters, be sure that you do not lose your joy. If you ever lose the joy of religion, you will lose the power of religion. Do not be satisfied to be a miserable believer. An unhappy believer is a poor creature, but he who is resigned to being so is in a dangerous condition. Depend upon it. Greater important, importance attaches to holy happiness than most people think. As you are happy in the Lord, you will be able to praise his name. Rejoice in the Lord that you may praise him. Amen. Let's not be miserable, grumbling, complaining believers. Trust the Lord. He is for you. He is not against you. But then the author continues by adding, that is the fruit of our lips that acknowledge his name. Remember, Jesus said, a good tree will produce good fruit. A bad tree will produce good bad fruit. So the fruit that is coming out of our lips is a result of a heart that has been changed for the glory of God. When he says fruit of lips, he's actually, the literal translation means we are to confess God's name. We are to confess God's glory. Yes, I remember, thank you for reminding me, uh, Psalmist, that Spurgeon did. He did struggle with depression. And to write those words, to say those things, and to preach what he preached is just a testimony to the goodness of God. So when we come together, when we confess God's name, when we sing the glorious praises of his name, we are openly proclaiming and we are submitting to God's attributes, to his gracious actions toward us in Jesus Christ. At the judgment, we read, every tongue will openly proclaim God's holy justice. They will bow before his rightful sovereignty. Then they will have no choice. But now, by God's grace, we can willingly offer a sacrifice of praise to God by bowing our hearts before him and reveling in who he is in his revealed words. So praise flows from a heart that has been brought into submission to God and to his word. When we see that his justice and his holiness, along with his mercy and love, are upheld at the cross, where the Son of God bore the wrath that was due for our sins, we will continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to him. When we see that God has saved us 
and called us to a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, we cannot help but praise him. We must continually work, casting off every thought of grumbling, every thought of discontent, and becoming a people who are to the praise of his glorious grace. First Peter says it well, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house to be holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. By the way, in, in, in these verses, the word you is in the plural. We don't have in English language, we don't have a plural form of the of the word you, but Greek does. And the Greek is you. It's speaking of ye, or as they say in the South, you all. <laughs> I think over here on the West Coast, we say you guys. So you guys, just think of it as that means it's corporate. It's all of us together are being built together as a spiritual house. And then he goes on, but you, all of you are a chosen race, a holy priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession. Why? That you, all of you, may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. The election and calling of God's people is not only for salvation, but for service as well. All believers are called to bear joyful witness to the saving acts of God. This was the mission of Israel, but they failed at it. Now this mission has been passed on to Christ, to the true Israel, to those who identify with him. And our text reminds us not only of the first great commandment to love God with all of our hearts through genuine praises, but also of the second commandment to love our neighbor as ourselves. And this brings us to the third point. Through Christ, we should offer to God continual sacrifices of good deeds. Do good is a general term for all kinds of practical ministry to others. Sacrifices of words must be accompanied by a sacrifice of loving deeds towards other. This word share is the Greek word koinonia, which means sharing the essentials of life with those who lack them and are unable to work to obtain them. The Bible is clear that religion that is only Godward and does not extend to practical ways to others is not genuine. It is not true. It outworks itself in the works that God has given us to do. In the book of 1 John, John writes these words, By this we know love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay our lives for the brothers. For if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brothers in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Mutual love in the fellowship of the believers is the evidence of a new life. It is based on the love of Jesus Christ who laid down his life in our place. Jesus taught the same thing when he said that we feed the hungry and when we drink, give drink to the thirsty, when we invite the stranger and clothe the naked, when we visit those who are sicker in prison, we are really doing it unto him and for his glory. And, it, and we see the imperative verb here, do not neglect. That implies here that some obviously were neglecting their duty and needed to stop doing so. So our responsibility, of course, first is primarily to fellow believers, but it does not stop there. Paul writes again in the book of Galatians, Let's, let me get this here for you. So then as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone and especially to those who are of the household of faith. 
I have to confess that in our modern world where we know instantly about needs around the globe, it's not easy to know how much to give and to whom to give. There are those that take advantage. We know that. But we should not let that stop us from being zealous for good deeds. And our text here is going to make one more point, And this brings us to point four. God is pleased with sacrifices of praise and good deeds. Such sacrifices re refers both to our sacrifices from our lips of praise and from our acts of good deeds. If we offered them apart from Christ, they would be vain. They would be an offensive attempt to commend our good deeds to God, which we cannot do. But when we offer them through Christ, God is pleased with them. And the aim of our lives should be to please God out of love for him. Look at the words that Paul uh, spoke to the Colossians in Colossians chapter 1. Yes, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness, to purify for himself a people for his own position. Well, thank you for pulling that verse. And so, Paul writes, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. We are ever looking intentionally for ways in which we can please our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We should live every day with the realization that one day we will stand before him. We should live so that we will hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your salvation. If through Christ we continue, continually offer to God the sacrifice of praise and good deeds, we will rejoice someday to hear those words. Just a couple of conclusions and we'll close out. First conclusion, God created you for a purpose, and that purpose is that you would live to glorify him and to enjoy him forever. How do we do this? What is the practical outworking of this? We do this by living in a manner pleasing to him. And how does that work? By coming to faith in Christ Jesus and his shed blood as the only way to be reconciled to the holy God. Having trusted in Christ, you please him by daily offering your life to him as a sacrifice of praise and some practical ways to walk this out. Let me give you a couple of these practical ways to walk this out now. I've already mentioned one, and that is to strengthen yourself in the Psalms. I have made a practice of reading three Psalms a day, and I can't tell you the strength that it brings me in times of my trouble and my struggles it strengthens me. It feeds me. I read about people that faced awful, terrible trials that were tempted, that had enemies come against them, that maligned against them. The book of Psalms, but it's also besides the problems and what, what we call impeccatory Psalms. Those are Psalms that call for judgment on your enemies. Besides that, the book of Psalms is filled with praises to God. It was the songbook of Israel. It was the songs that Jesus would have known, that he would have sung himself. So turn the Psalms into your praises as you pray them back to God, even reading them out loud. It has so much more meaning. We we sing Psalms every Sunday in church, and, and it's magnificent to sing the Psalms of God to his glory and to praise him. I would encourage you another thing, okay? Um, I, Shalom, that's a good question. I actually read the three that day as well. <laughs> it's a long one. It takes, a, it's 119. It, it actually takes, seriously, it only takes about 10 minutes to read through Psalm 119. It's 176 verses. 
So yeah, I, I, I include that in my, my, my daily reading. And, and you can, in 50 days, you get to this book of Psalms, you can read it seven times in a year. Okay. Now, discarding, don't think about musical styles. Some of us like hymns, some of us like psalms, some of us like spiritual psalms. I like all three, as long as they are good and meaty and doctrinally sound. But I would encourage you to read five a day, get through psalms every month. Yay, lady. That's an, that's an undertaking that would be fun. The, some of the great hymns of the church have excellent doctrine in them. And I would encourage you to read through some of them. Um, if you don't know the tunes, that's okay. Just There's some wonderful recordings available. YouTube is filled with recordings of the hymns. But the words are amazing. The words are amazing. Just read to those and get some good doctrines. And one more practical thing that we can do. Actually, I have two more. Look for opportunities to serve rather than to be served. Remember, Mark 10, 45 says that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. There are many needs in, in the church body. There are many needs um, on a chat server. There are many needs in real life, in your neighborhood, as, real, as well as in your community, to do good to share. There are many organizations that do great works that you can help out, that you can give. Find opportunities to do that. And the last practical suggestion, make it your first priority of every day to find delight and joy in God. Your chief end is to glorify him by enjoying him forever. Find enjoyment and communion with your heavenly Father through the gracious provision of Christ, your Savior. Delight in Jesus. Exalt in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'll close out with one of my favorite quotes from one of my favorite authors, which is Michael Reeves. He wrote in his book, Rejoicing in Christ, and many of you have read this book, Jesus Christ God's perfect son is the beloved of the father, the song of the angels, the logic of creation, the great mystery of godliness, the bottomless spring of life, comfort and joy. We were made to find our satisfaction, our hearts rest in him. He is our rest. He is our joy. And I will guarantee you, your day will be different if you begin this way. Amen. Well, I have a song to play for you. It is one of actually my wife's and my favorite. On Sunday, we celebrated Reformation Day. And naturally, in our celebration day, celebration of the Reformation, we sang hymns by Martin Luther. So I am going to play you his most famous. If you know the words, it's a mighty fortress is our God. And then I will close us in prayer. <laughs>
love that last line, his kingdom is forever. And I know Mario was singing Ein Festeburg. If I pronounced that right, I don't know. That's the German version, but let's close in prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Father, that we are in Christ, that we have the opportunity to come before your majesty because of the final and full and complete atonement of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It is because of his work that we have access to the Father, that we have peace and joy and comfort, and every promise in Christ is yes and amen. Father, help us to continually offer our sacrifice of praise, to put aside our grumbling, our complaining, and to lift your name in awesome praise and glory. For it is in Christ Jesus we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, and God bless to everyone. And may you be blessed and continually offer that sacrifice of praise. God bless.